Hello and welcome to Virtual Coast Fest 2020. I'm Jackson Burgess, a fifth grader at C.B. Greer. Here in our studio today, I'm joined by Amy and Josh, and today we're exploring changing beaches. Thank you, Jackson. My name is Amy Flowers, and I'm a cord uh, permit coordinator with the Coastal Resources Division. I've been in this job for approximately two years. Part of my job is to help administer the Shore Protection Act, which helps to protect the states and coastal counties of Georgia. Um, I'm also a new mom to Henry Flowers, who was born in early July. Hey, and I'm Josh Noble. Um, I'm a program manager here with the Coastal Resources Division. I've been here for 17 years. Amy and I work together um, in the permitting program, and we'd now like to show you a short video about what we do every day for DNR. We'll be back to answer your questions via YouTube and Facebook soon. If you've been to the beach in coastal Georgia, you've probably noticed changes in the size and shape of our dunes, maybe the width of the beach, or even how sandbars seem to be constantly moving. The natural and human forces that cause these changes can be subtle and sometimes very abrupt. Our dunes, beaches, sandbars, and shoals are all part of one dynamic network known as the sand shearing system. This vital ecological network protects Georgia's coast from storms, flooding, erosion, and resulting property loss or damage. Within this network are coastal barrier islands like Tybee, Sea, St. Simons, and Jekyll. The islands are constantly changing in size and shape in a process that has been occurring for thousands of years. Throughout time, currents have caused the islands to slowly migrate as waves push sand along near beaches to inlets between them, changing the island shape. As a result, the islands slowly move. As one island grows, the flow of current through the inlets between them erodes the island on the opposite shore in a long-term cycle that connects all of the islands along our coast. Sometimes you may notice your favorite beach will change with the season. Small waves can transport sand onto a beach in summer and fall through a natural process called a longshore current. In the winter and spring, large waves can remove sand in a force known as erosion. This natural seasonal transition reshapes the beach and causes changes in the dune system that are less subtle than the long-term migration of our barrier islands and is fairly easy to recognize. Have you ever been to the beach following a storm? You may have seen that large portions of sand have been washed away or eroded, uncovering hidden rocks or structures. Hurricanes and nor'easters can have an immediately noticeable effect on our beaches. Extreme weather tides can cause flooding and erosion in low-lying areas, and constant wind and waves can displace huge amounts of sand in a very short period of time. Events like these are called episodic changes. These sudden, dramatic changes are probably the easiest for most people to spot. Strong storms can reshape the coastline for decades or even centuries. The evolution of our shoreline not only depends on these long-term seasonal and episodic changes, but also in how we as humans react to these events. The building of shoreline protection structures like seawalls and jetties could potentially alter the sand sharing system and careful consideration must be made when deploying these man-made solutions. Georgia's Shore Protection Act, which became law in 1979, provides the measures required to protect our shorelines and the collective resources like dunes and beaches within the sand sharing system. It is the mission of the Coastal Resources Division of the Georgia Department of Natural Resources to ensure that the provisions of the Act are implemented so our coast may be enjoyed by generations to come. Now that you know some of the causes, the next time you're at the beach, see if you can notice if the shoreline has changed since your last visit. Do the dunes look the same? Is the beach any wider? What do the sandbars look like at low tide? Can you imagine what it might look like in 100 years? We hope you've enjoyed learning about Georgia's ever-changing beaches and our partnership with nature in preserving our coast. We'll see you at Coast Fest 2021. All right, welcome back to the Coast Fest studio. Amy and Josh are ready to take any questions you may have about their program. To ask a question, use the chat feature on YouTube Live or comment on our live Facebook feed. To use the YouTube live chat, you'll need to sign in as a user and set up your YouTube channel. You can find directions at www.coastalgadnr.org slash coastfest. While we wait on questions to come in, I'm going to go ahead and get started with a few of my own. Why are sand dunes important? That's a really great question, Jackson. 
So sand dunes are important because they are really our first line of defense against the damaging effects of storms, wave action, and wind. Um, so it's really important when you go to the beach that you're respectful of our sand dunes and that you don't walk on them or do anything that's going to hurt them. For instance, when you go to the beach, you should notice that there's always going to be some kind of an access point, whether it is via what we call a wooden crossover or whether it is just a sectioned off path in the sand to get you from the land up and over to the sand or to the beach. Um, now, we want to use those every time we go to the beach because if you were to walk on the sand dune itself, um, you could end up starting to destroy the sand dune. And then in the next storm or the next time we have a big wave or wind event, we can end up having an issue where uh, water actually comes through uh, the dunes and ends up uh, damaging inland. So, uh, good point, Amy, and, and also, too, one thing to consider is the importance that, that sand dunes serve for wildlife habitat, for uh, migrating uh, shorebirds, uh, seabirds, um, and, and all sorts of other uh, critters like uh, ghost crabs, uh, dune grasshoppers, mice, rabbits, um, and migrating shorebirds actually will, um, will nest within the dunes and use the natural temperatures, the very high temperatures, which are up to 120 degrees in order to uh, incubate their eggs. So as Amy was saying, it's very important to leave those areas undisturbed for, um, for all those reasons. When I dig a hole, Ah, it looks like we have a question from Miss Landclasser's class. The question is, do you see sea turtles often? If so, have you ever saved a turtle before? Also, what is the most rare creature you have seen while on the beach? These are all really great, great questions. So do I see sea turtles often? I can't say that I see them often, but they are fairly prevalent or uh, they occur a lot from May until November every year. That is during the sea turtle nesting season here in the state of Georgia. Um, so you can uh, occasionally see the actual hatchlings, which is actually the, the small uh, baby turtles, if you will. Um, and you can actually sometimes see where the moms have come ashore. You can see their tracks in the sand, which is really very cool. Um, have I personally ever saved a sea turtle before? I can't say I have, but I do know that people in uh, DNR or within Coastal Resources Division have. Um, and what is the most rare creature that I've seen on the beach? That's a good one. Um, I'm not sure, rare creature. I think one of the coolest creatures that I've seen, um, or just they look funny, are horseshoe crabs. They're kind of prehistoric looking. They've got this really cool brown dark shell and these crazy looking legs that just look prehistoric and, and kind of funny. What about you, Josh? Um, I, much like yourself, Amy, I've not personally don't see sea turtles very often, but when we start early days here, here at work, sometimes we have to get up very early um, and be on the beach not long after sunrise. And what you'll do is you'll see um, evidence of where sea turtles have came in um, overnight and nested at the, the toe of the dunes. Um, there's a lot of people coastwide that, that work very hard in order to not only mark those nests every morning, but also to protect those throughout the entire season. Um, one such center um, dedicated to that, to that is the Georgia Sea Turtle Center here on Jekyll Island. Um, they do fantastic work. They do, um, Dr. Norton and his team have um, uh, spent a lot of time um, and built quite the sea turtle hospital, if you will, in order to um, educate the public about the sea turtles, but also um, to rescue injured sea turtles and rehabilitate them. So it looks like we have another question from Jonathan Watkins. What does your department do when a hurricane comes through and changes the coastline? I would say the first thing that we do is prepare and um, from a permitting standpoint, which is my position here, is that we reach out to the different homeowners and individuals that it might have damage from uh, said hurricane, and we help them via the permitting process to help them either rebuild their docks or we come back to their, uh, go to their house and look at the beach and see how it's changed. Yeah, and to add to that, Amy, also um, we, we work with the local governments in order to coordinate responses, um, you know, coastwide and in order that all of our resources 
um, are, are allocated to be able to respond quickly but also efficiently. Um, in recent years, the hurricane that we've had, one thing that the permitting program did was we uh, had a non-essential moratorium on all, or a moratorium on all non-essential permitting activities, and we focused only on um, contacting the public in order to get, to get their properties whole again. A lot of marine debris, it was a large marine debris cleanup. Um, our team also set up a call center, which was staffed by the entire team of approximately six people. Um, that was eight hours a day, and, and at times we were, we were taking as many as 400 phone calls in a week. Um, and that was a 90-day moratorium, and, um, and since then, uh, so we've got a good baseline should Georgia, uh, in order to be able to respond to such event in the future. So it looks like we have a question coming in from Robert Todd. Um, it's actually from the McIntosh County Academy Commercial Fisheries class. So with the changing of the beach shorelines due to storms, how has this affected the habitat of creatures such as sea turtles and other beach life? So that's a really good question. So how has it changed? Um, when hurricanes or other large storm events occur on the Georgia coast, a lot of times we see a lot of erosion. So what that means is sometimes our beaches can go from really wide, nice beaches that you have fun going to and playing at, to these really short, kind of stubby, steep beaches. And that's all due to erosion. Um, and so how that changes for things like sea turtles, does it mean there's not as much beach for turtles to be able to use? Um, it also means that sometimes we have to, um, in the natural resources world, have to look at options such as hardening our shorelines or doing some kind of beach renourishment. Yeah, and something to add there as well is, um, you know, after um, we see these, these events, um, we'll see scarp lines um, where you'll see a, a steep drop, which uh, one, of the, one of the biggest things that we, we ask or coordinate with folks on doing is knocking down those scarp lines in order to ensure that those, uh, those sea turtles, especially during sea turtle nesting season, have, uh, have good habitat in order to nest and recover after a storm. Looks like we have another question from Mr. Watkins. So how does dredging sand affect the beaches and inlets? So um, dredging is, um, it has, uh, it can create um, uh, erosion in areas, but also accretion on the southern ends of the islands. Um, but when you're dredging, typically what are you dredging for? So oftentimes what dredging is for is say for borrowing sand from areas in order to restore a beach, re-nourish a beach. Mm -hmm. Okay. When I dig a hole or build a sand castle at the beach, what should I do before I go home? That's a really good question. So we all love to have fun at the beach, and you might want to build your sandcastle, complete with a nice moat for water, maybe dig your dad into the sand. But it's really important when you're done that you fill back in that hole. And the reason for that, first and foremost, is for wildlife. So things like sea turtles use our beaches, again, throughout the summer from May until November. And so we want to make sure that those sea turtles don't end up getting caught um, within the holes or anything that you would have made. Or in terms of a, a sandcastle, they could end up crawling up onto it and getting stuck and not being able to make it out to the beach. And so again, we just want to make sure every time we go to the beach, have fun, enjoy yourself, but make sure to smooth that sand back over so that you have, um, you're, you're not impeding any of the wildlife. Looks like we have another question from uh, somebody, Miss Leslie Jones class. Why is it important to stay off the sand dunes? So um, it's very important, it's all about stability. Um, the sand dunes are very delicate, um, the way that they're built, uh, they're wind driven, and um, these, when the wind carries sand, um, it, it, it's, it's caused to drop out when it, um, when it hits such things like sea oats or panic grasses. Um, the big thing is, is you don't wanna destabilize the dune, and so um, in order to access the beach, uh, here in the permitting program, we work with local governments and private landowners in order to build uh, wooden crosswalks across the dunes that then still allow for the migrating nature of, of the dynamic dune field. What is sand made of? Now that's a really cool question. So sand throughout the world is made up of totally different things. Um, so if you go to a beach here in Georgia or you go to a beach in Hawaii, they can be made up of different things. 
However, uh, here in Georgia, you mostly find things like degraded rock and uh, corals and shells, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, what's really cool is sand is a lot like snowflakes. If you've ever heard the saying that no one snowflake is the same as another, sand is the same way. If you get a microscope and you take a little scoop of sand and you look at it under there, you'll be able to see tiny little shells and little minerals and things like that. And it, it's really cool to actually look at that. Um, another fun fact um, that I think is really fun about sand is um, there's different types of beaches. So in places like Hawaii, you have black sand, green sand, pink, white. Whereas here you might have like more of a yellow beach. Well, in Hawaii, the white sand beaches are actually made up of parrot poop, par uh, parrot fish poop. So it's this type of fish that actually eats on the calcified corals. And when it poops out, it actually makes white sand. And so that's why you'll, you'll find white sand beaches in Hawaii, which I think is pretty cool. We have another question uh, coming in from Miss Jennifer Mullen. So Miss Mullen's first grade class asks, is there less sand on the beach after a hurricane because of the ocean taking it away? Yes. To answer that question, yes, there is. Oftentimes we see um, a, a lot of erosion. Um, and as we were talking about not long ago was um, that erosion, you'll see it, it, it creates a very tall scarp line. Um, and it also will um, uh, cause the profile of the beach to drop. So um, when we're talking such things, uh, in, in order post-storm, one, one of the things that are considered is maybe beach nourishment. And in beach nourishment projects, uh, that beach profile is very important. You want a low sloping profile for a, for, an, for a beach in order to mimic a natural beach, in order to ensure that you have that, um, that, suit that suitable nesting habitat for uh, sea turtles, but also that foraging habitat for, for shorebirds. That's the, the foreshore area or, or what's called the intertidal beach. I think something to remember too is that it's not always, or it's not that the sand disappears. It enters and it might go into the ocean and it might end up on a shoal or it might go to the south end of an island. And that is all a part of the sand sharing process, as, as we say, the sand sharing process. So we have another question from Mr. Jonathan Watkins. Why is it important to stay off exposed sandbars? So, excellent question. Um, exposed sandbars are, um, Again, they, they provide uh, suitable habitat for nesting migratory shorebirds um, and also foraging habitat, feeding habitat for, for those birds. But also it's a, um, um, a habitat for such things as um, red drum. The, the spawning of red drum occur on those, on those shoals as well. So it's really essentially all about wildlife habitat, ensuring that um, if you're there, you try to minimize your impact on it in order to minimize those impacts on that import feeding and nesting nesting habitat. And just to add to that, it's also a safety concern. Um, here in Georgia, we have really strong high tides that come in really quick. And so what you don't want to do is end up getting caught out on a, a sandbar during that tide coming in and, and end up getting in trouble. Another question coming in from Mr. Watkins. How does dredging sand affect the beaches and inlets? So dredging sand in, in the beaches and inlets, um, again, the, what, what is dredging for? Typically, dredge projects are designed in order to improve uh, navigation for shipping, um, um, for um, the two ports that we have here on the coast of Georgia, the Savannah Port and, and the Brunswick Port. Um, and also, too, dredging is, um, is, has been utilized for um, offshore borrowing sand in order to um, uh, restore beaches like beach nourishment projects, um, but also these dredging activities um, are being uh, evaluated currently um, because of the sediments that are produced from those projects. Um, how can we beneficially use those? And so um, beneficial uses is something that, that we at the, the state of Georgia are working with our federal resource partners in order to find ways to improve habitat help restore shorelines that have been uh, experienced severe erosion um, and, and try to really think outside of the box about what we can do with those, those uh, useful materials. So we have another question coming in from Miss Lancaster's class. They ask, your video answered our other questions on how the beaches change. We are wondering though if these changes are positive, negative, or neutral. 
I think that really depends on who you're asking. Are you asking us as humans? Or are you asking the wildlife that uses our beaches? For humans, obviously, if you have a house that's on the beach or you have your favorite beach that you go to and a storm takes away or erodes part of your beach, it might be sort of a negative effect to you. Or if you live on the beach, it might be a negative effect. Um, but in some cases during storms, it will actually take sand accretion or bring sand to different parts of different islands. Um, and it could make the habitat for different species, whether it's migratory birds or shorebirds or uh, different uh, vertebrate critters, um, it could actually make better habitat for them. So I think it really depends on who you're talking about in this case. We have another question coming in from Miss Jones, second grade class. How do the animals survive a hurricane? That's a really great question. So um, that is not my specialty. I'll be upfront with that. Um, but uh, all animals are designed to, to, A, I think, know when storms are coming. And so they have their own ways to protect themselves, whether it's shorebirds finding some kind of place to kind of um, hone in and, 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 and make it through, or they can even feel the pressure changes and they might try to avoid, avoid the storm that's coming through. And that's all the time we have for this session on a virtual Coast Fest. We hope you've enjoyed learning about the Coastal Resources Division mission. Tune in next time. <laughs>